Where we stopped last time, we were talking about sum of pairs, multiple alignment. And in particular, we were talking about various method co methods called progressive alignment, where progressive, in progressive alignment, uh, you would have under, underneath the algorithm somehow some kind of tree where uh, the number of nodes in the tree was equal to the number of sequences you're trying to align. And each sequence labeled one node on the tree. And then the uh, multiple alignment that was constructed was consistent with that particular tree. The question that, that was uh, raised is how do you find the, tr the right tree to work with? And that's something we'll discuss today a little bit. But where we ended last time was with this idea of a uh, center tree And what you put in the center is the only variable. Since, since this tree is a star, uh, the only issue is what's at the, what sequence is at the center, and therefore which of the ones are at the outside. And what we put at the center was the sequence that minimizes summation D i j. So it's the sequence SI. So its summed difference, its sum distance to each of the other sequences is the smallest overall. And you want to think geometrically, uh, you know, if you have a set of points in the plane here somehow, and you think about the distance, you pick a particular point, and you think of its distance to everybody else, and you sum that up and another point, and you sum that up. Geometrically, which is the one that's going to look, uh, have the smallest sum? It's going to be somehow somebody sort of in the middle here. I don't know between these two, which two is going to look, have the smallest sum. That's sort of what's going on in this thing. If you think of these distances geometrically, then um, the summation of the distance between SI and everybody else if that's smaller than, than any other uh, such sum, then it's kind of a central represent, representative. It's sometimes called a median string or a central string. At any rate, that's, that's the tree that we looked at last time. And the nice feature of that tree is that you can actually prove that under the sum of pairs objective function, what you get out of the alignment that's consistent with the center star or center tree, that's represented here. That's summation of the induced alignment between every pair. And you divide that by something you know no multiple alignment can do better than this. Whether any multiple alignment can even do as well as this is not clear. But certainly no multiple alignment can ever do as well can do, ever do better than this. So if this ratio is relatively small, that's a good thing. It, it's, it says that the induced alignment, which was something that was practical to compute, was not too far off what uh, would be the optimal, because the optimal is somewhere has a, has a total score somewhere between this one and this one. And what you can prove is that this ratio is less than or equal to 2 minus 2 over k, where k is the number of sequences. And um, whenever you see something like this, you should always, I always, at least look at the degenerate ends of these things just to see that you, this passes some kind of sanity test. The most degenerate end of this is when k equals 2, right? Actually, when k equals 1, I guess, is even more degenerate. All right. So when k equals 1, this is 2 minus 2. That's 0. That's 2 degenerate. When k equals 2, this is 2 minus 1, which is 1. All right. And does that make sense in this context? You have to see, does this pass the sanity test? Does this, does this make sense? What is this saying? Uh, if you only have two sequences, then the ratio of this to this is less than or equal to 1. Well, of course, we always know it's greater than or equal to 1, so it's got to be equal to 1. 
And is that sensible for the algorithm? Does the algorithm really seem like it's always going to do that well? Well, what does it do when there are only two sequences? The tree is like this. Okay, one's the center, and I mean the other one's the center too. It does the pairwise alignment here. That's its multiple alignment of those two sequences. And so, of course, the pairwise alignment is the best, is as good as any pairwise. I mean, the optimal pairwise alignment, which is the first step of, the, of this algorithm, is as good as the optimal pairwise alignment because that's what it just did. It computed the optimal pairwise alignment and stopped. Okay, so at any rate, when k equals 2, this is fine. And when k is huge, this thing is close to 2. So what this is saying is that um, even though we're not guaranteed to be the best possible multiple alignment under the sum of pairs objective function, we're never, um, this ratio is never more than 2. Okay, in fact, it never really gets to be 2, which is a reasonable guarantee. All right. Now, when I started talking about sum of pairs multiple alignment, I said that there, there really is no objective function for multiple alignment that's as well accepted as, let's say, uh, similarity or even distance is for two sequences. And in your exercise this week that you just turned in or will turn in soon, uh, one of the things you were supposed to do was to look at whether the star was producing multiple alignments that seemed reasonable in comparison to the globe in alignment that you started with, which was considered to be a good one, or even what um, Clostal was producing. And I don't really know the answer. You have to look as biologists at those multiple alignments and see whether you think uh, the similarity between them is, is high enough or whether one looks much better than the other. But what I will say in the defense of STAR, uh, because I expect STAR will in the end look bad in comparison, uh, is that a lot of these things depend on uh, things that you tune in the algorithm or in the program, such as the weight matrix. The weight matrix that we're using in your exercise I don't know where, where it came from. It's just something I grabbed from somewhere. Uh, whereas Clostal and, and, um, and certainly the multiple alignment you started with were, were nicely tuned. The other thing about STAR, if you look in the program, when it's doing pairwise alignment, there's no gap term in the objective function. And we saw that gaps were very important in trying to organize the spaces into, into a few runs or a few gaps. And if you have spaces all percolated throughout the sequence, they get translated into the multiple alignment. And somebody observed this morning that when they ran all 12 of the sequences, uh, you got a multiple alignment that a lot of small, uh, spa small gaps distributed through it. So it didn't look very good. So uh, the next thing to try to do in STAR, if somebody wants to work on this as a project, is to um, implement gap uh, in the gaps in the objective function, which will probably push the, uh, uh, the gaps closer together, the spaces closer together into a few, into a few gaps. But the main virtue of, of this center tree is it allows you to prove this theorem because for this field there are very few theorems that are actually proven. So now let me compare this to uh, how Clustal actually works. So the other reason for going through this is that it lets us talk in more generality before we talk about Clustal. Clustal is also progressive alignment. And it also uses a tree. It builds a tree, and then it builds a multiple alignment consistent with that tree. So it follows exactly the same paradigm that we've been talking about. And then it has... I don't know, umpteen many thousand lines of code of fiddling. So we're not going to tell you about fiddling. We're not going to tell you about fiddling because you know, there's always something you can do to, to try to clean things up. But in terms of what's principled, what, what the ideas are, uh, it builds a tree, which I'll tell you about, and then it builds a multiple alignment consistent with that tree. Now, just to see who's, who's done their Clustal homework, what does Clustal call their tree? 
wouldn't necessarily know that. But I mean, if you've been reading Clostal documentation or tutorials or whatever, you might you might have come across it. Now, it's, it's I think it's called a guide tree. So in Clostal, they think of it of building this tree as guiding the multiple alignment that's being built. Okay, and it's a different tree than than the star. The star is very simple. The only way the star is really encoding the data, because it's always a star in the program, is uh, just the single variable as to who goes in the center. Otherwise, the tree is always the same, no matter what data you give it. But Clostal builds a very different tree, or can build a different tree, each time you give it different data. And uh, the way it does this, well, let, let me think of pairwise distances. So here we have pairwise distances. So one, two, three, four. Let's just imagine we have four sequences. Okay? And we've calculated all pairs of the distances. So that's that's symmetric. So it may just be the you know the upper portion of the triangle of the uh, of this table here, the upper triangle. And the first thing it does is it looks in here and it finds the smallest value. Okay, let's say 1, 4 is the smallest. It excludes the, excludes the diagonal because uh, I'm just going to make up some numbers. Okay. So let's say the distance between sequence 1 and sequence 4 was 26, and that's the smallest of all of these numbers that are in there. So it will now have a node for 1, a node for 4. If we want, we can just write the distance along there. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Then it will look and uh, see what the next smallest one is. Maybe it's uh, 2, 3, 33. 2 and 3 has 33. Okay. Uh, and then it will um, uh, find the next smallest one, which um, let's say is 1, 3, 46. And now it, it has a tree that contains all of the sequence numbers, the four of them. right? And so it would... Uh, use that tree as the guide tree. It would now build a multiple alignment that's consistent with that one. Let me just, just to um, get a little more interesting things happening here, let me add one more node. Okay? Now, the next smallest one, when it looks into here, it may be 4-3. Um, 4-3. Four, three. Four, three. Which actually, yeah, if we're doing upper triangle, it's 3, 4. Okay. So that would put, you would think of this edge here, but there's already a way of getting from 3 to 4. 3 and 4 are already together in the same portion of the tree. They're already connected. So this uh, edge that's 50 doesn't extend the tree in any way, so you can just ignore it and keep going. And so we would continue to looking at the, the next smallest and the next smallest and the next smallest until when? How, how would the, uh, the algorithm stop building the tree? What has to happen? What event has to happen? You have to add a new node, which in this case is 5. Okay. So let's just say eventually you got uh, 1, 5 uh, at 60. Okay. So you end up with this tree. This is not a real example. I haven't given you real sequences. I'm just showing you sort of by cartoon what the process is. So you have um, a tree. Clustal calls it a guide tree. Clustal then builds a multiple alignment that's consistent with that tree. And uh, then once it gets the multiple alignment, it does various things to try to clean it up, which I call fiddling just because there's no principled idea that's easy to communicate as to what it's doing when it's cleaning up the multiple alignment. 
All right. I guess I have two two questions. For this tree, uh, name that tree. I guess that's not really a question, but has anybody seen a name for this kind of a tree? Actually, somebody last Friday suggested this after class. That's probably only the people who've taken some computer science courses like CS122. Who was it? Somebody here last week. Well, maybe not here. It wasn't you? No? Uh, all right. Um, somebody, minimum spanning tree. So there is a notion in computer science of if I have a graph where I have every edge in there with some weight, and we don't have the whole data, but if I had if I had all the data here written in here, and then I put an edge in for every pair, and I wrote on that edge the weight that came from here, or the distance that came from here, then this is called, when I have all those edges in there, it's called a complete graph. And there are many, many trees in there, okay, that are subgraphs. If I pick out the tree whose total weight on all the edges, when you sum up the edges, edge weights, the total weight is the smallest. That's something called a minimum spanning tree. Okay. So really what, what Klostal is doing is finding the minimum spanning tree from this data and then using that as a guide tree. Okay. Now there's a second name that people might know. Since nobody... So this is, the, this is the computer science answer to that question. Uh, what's, what's another name for this tree that the statisticians all know and love? I'm putting them on the spot. Okay. Uh, there's another thing that comes up in... Um, no, I, I see that you... Yeah, what, what's the suggestion? No, it's not a decision tree. No, no, no. Uh, what? Clustering. Clustering? What was what was the word? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to be uh, too weird. Um, single link clustering. This is actually more of a process. The tree itself. Um, the way the statisticians usually write it looks different. But there's a process of clustering data to emphasize which is closest to which. And the simplest version of clustering, the simplest clustering algorithm that comes out of statistics is something called single link clustering. And that's building the same tree here as uh, we're doing, the minimum spanning tree. They draw it differently. What they would do in, now if I pretend to be a statistician, I would say, okay, one and four are the closest. One and four, instead of drawing a line between them, I'll draw it like that. And saying these two are clustered together. They're, they're a very uh, similar cluster. That's one, four. And the next one is two, three. Okay, and the next one is um, one three. Well, one's already in a cluster, three's already in a cluster, so what it really does is it ties those two clusters together. Okay, and then the next one, uh, next smallest one was three four, but three four is already together in a cluster, that's not of any use. And then finally one five, five is already in a cluster, but one is already in a cluster, but five is not. And so they would draw their system of clusters that way. This is, a, this is a cluster, this is a cluster, and then this is a bigger one. And this is the outcome of single-link clustering. But you see it's making the same choices that we were making when we built the minimum spanning tree. One, four go together, two, three go together, uh, 
one and three go together, so they got connected, and then finally one and five went together. Um, and so, in fact, I think if you Clustal uh, has an option of looking at their guide tree, and I think if you look at their guide tree, you're going to get something that looks more like this. It looks more like a phylogenetic tree, uh, evolutionary tree, than what uh, I've been drawing. But conceptually, these are all just different ways of thinking about or drawing the same kinds of mathematical objects. Ma mathematically, these are all the same things. And uh, so Clustal is a progressive alignment method. It uses a guide tree of the kind that I've been talking about. It's different than the center tree because of the particular guide tree it uses and then what it does to clean up the multiple alignment. Uh, and then, of course, in the package, it has all kinds of nice bells and whistles for displaying the multiple alignment with colors and all kinds of stuff. All right. Now, just think intuitively, by the way. Does, does anybody have any intuitive sense as to which of these two progressive alignment methods should work best? Oh, I should say one thing more about Clustal, and actually it's, it's true about Star as well. When I have a particular tree, whether it's this tree or a tree that Clustal would build, I said that, that a, um, uh, a multiple alignment that's consistent with that tree can be built, and these algorithms do build a multiple alignment that's consistent with the tree. And we prove that there does exist a, an alignment that's consistent with that tree by working in kind of from the outside. Uh, or we, we took an edge that was on the outside of the tree and we aligned those two sequences and then we always aligned somebody new to somebody who was old already in the sequence. The order in which you add new things into the tree can make a difference in the final outcome of what the multiple alignment is, okay? And so you might ask, is there, is there a ordering that would seem better, uh, one ordering that seems better than other orderings? Well, this is just sort of an intuitive thing. No takers? Okay, so you've got, again, you have this tree. Let me draw another tree. And I'm going to put the weights, the, the distances on the edges. This was distance 10, 26, uh, 13, um, 17, 29. I'm just making up some numbers. There, is a, there are multiple alignments that are consistent with this tree. I could start here and do this pair, align this pair, and then bring in this one. Or I could have, after I did this one, bring in this one. Or you know, a variety of different orderings would work. And the question is, is, is there an ordering that seems the best to do? Well, Klostal's answer to that question is to always start with the smallest number, the two that are, cl that are the, the most similar. They want to be sure those are aligned. The multiple alignment reflects those guys, okay? So it would do that one first. And then it has a choice of either doing this one or this one, but it would do this one next because 13 is smaller than 26. And then it would do 17 next and then it really doesn't matter whether it does, well, it doesn't, I don't, well, I think it would probably do the 26 first and then the 29. So it brings in new sequences in order of these distances, smallest first, okay, which seems like a good idea. And I think that, that star is doing the same thing too. When you have the option of running the star, it says, shall we sort? 
I think what it's doing is um, that's saying when you say yes, you're insisting that you'll bring in the sequences into the multiple alignment in order of their distance from the center. So if this distance here is 5 and this is 16, it will bring this sequence into the multiple alignment by doing this pairwise sequence before it does this pairwise sequence alignment, okay? So anyway, that's another, um, uh, another feature of Clostal. It's important to, uh, uh, to remember that, uh, okay. Earlier, before Clostal was invented or before it was written, uh, people who developed the basic idea of progressive multiple alignment, and this is um, R. Doolittle, had a way of describing how it works by saying once a gap, always a gap. So when you align two sequences early on in the process and you create a gap, in that alignment, that gap remains in the multiple alignment no matter what else you do later on. And the justification for that was that you're going to align early on sequences that are very close to each other. And therefore, it's what you get from the pairwise alignment is reliable or more reliable than what you might get by looking at two sequences whose pairwise distance is farther apart. So if you're aligning two sequences that are fairly similar, their, their pairwise distance is small, and it says this gap is in, the multiple, is in that pairwise alignment, then it seems believable that you ought to keep it in the multiple alignment uh, from that point on, and, you, and that's exactly what happens in progressive alignment. That gap gets preserved as you continue to add in additional sequences. Okay. So I think that's all, really all I want to say about um, Clostal it's, it's, uh, and its relationship to STAR. Um, there are other multiple alignment methods out there, lots of them. And from, um, well, I already told you about MSA, which is a dynamic programming based. Uh, there are other ones that are based on finding things like KMERS that are common to many of the sequences, and then they line up those KMERS and they call those things um, anchors or pillars or something that really suggests that it's a slice of the multiple alignment that's highly similar. And then you would look between those slices or between those pillars to see what you should do inside there. And you can uh, do that idea recursively or you can ultimately go to some progressive alignment for the sequences between the pillars. So I think that's it for multiple alignment. Now, what I want to do from, uh, for the rest of this week, and it probably will continue a little bit into the next week, is to really talk about uses of multiple alignment. Uh, and now there are many uses of multiple alignment. I'm just going to be talking about things that really uh, impact the kind of sequence analysis that we've been trying to uh, look at in this class. And so these will be things like um, uh, position-specific scoring matrices, which we'll talk about today, things like Cyblast, which is in, your, in the lab for this week, um, Prosite. Now, that's not really a good example of it, but that's in your lab for this week. Um, HMMs, hidden Markov models, which is also in your lab. And that really goes two, two ways, both uses of multiple alignment and also uh, hidden Markov models are used to create multiple alignments um, and so on. But... There's a larger, before I, get it, before I get into all of this stuff, there's a larger theme that I want to talk about, which is the converse of the first fact of uh, sequence analysis. Everybody remember the first fact? The 
talked about on the first or second day of the uh, of the course. Anybody want to summarize what that is? Well, all right. Uh, sequence similarity. implies some kind of biological similarity. Biological meaning functional, and maybe it's not biological, maybe it's chemical. Biological, uh, you know, function, or maybe it's three-dimensional structure, or just two-dimensional structure, or maybe just uh, common evolutionary history. But the point is that by seeing sequence similarity, you can infer some biological similarity. And that's really what we've been doing for most of the uh, course up to now by using alignments, whether it's local or global alignment, by using BLAST, which is a way of speeding up alignments, looking for good local similarities uh, in a, among huge databases. That's as a matter of practicality because you can't do the pairwise uh, dynamic programming alignment for all the sequences in a database. Uh, and this has been a very powerful uh, plan of action, that by using sequence similarity, you can infer biological similarity. Uh, and that's really what I've said is paid all the bills. That's why we have a course here and people are interested in this stuff and so on. But I said that the converse was not true, okay, or not any way strongly true, not so obviously true that you can just use it in the opposite direction. What, would the opposite, what, is, what is the opposite direction I'm talking about? Right. You can just read it backwards. It's not true that when you have biological or chemical similarity, you necessarily have sequence similarity, or that the sequence similarity is so obvious that you just have to do some kind of simple alignment or look at them and say, yeah, of course. Okay? But there is some, bio there is some sequence signal that is usually there or that people believe should be there, that they're willing to look for it very deeply. So if you have molecules which are similar or related. So here's similarity, I should say, related as well. If you have uh, molecules that are related in some way by function, by structure, by history, but it's not obvious that, they're, that their sequence is the same, you want to look much more deeply into those sequences uh, and into the, into the sequences of, of a set of molecules to see if you can find some sequence similarity, some way of extracting some um, reflection of what those are. So that means that we start off here with families related by function, well, by biology, or chemistry, okay? Anyway, by some uh, something that's of value in terms of the science, not just sequence, but uh, in terms of the science, that ties these various molecules together, okay? Protein families or other families of, of, uh, of molecules. And then you try Try to find patterns or signatures in these. We've actually talked about some examples of this. Procyte. We said procyte has many families, protein families, and tries for each one to come up with a regular expression that says the for a family, each sequence in that family has matches this regular expression, and the sequences that are not in that family generally do not 
match that reg regular expression. And then that regular expression is a, is a way of saying what is similar in the sequences between the members in this family. Okay? Uh, e motif, there are a whole variety of these things that um, we'll talk a little bit about that are very, very valuable to use in this direction. Okay, well, to have uh, these kind of patterns, it's very, very useful to have those patterns that tell you what is common, even though it may be very faint, what's common in sequence between these molecules that are in the same family. All right? And how do they get those patterns? How do you take a family that you know is related by biology and pull out the significant similarities? And that's, that's the kind of thing I want to talk about today. How many of you have, have seen the, um, on the ProSite? In today's lab, I told you you should look at a ProSite page on how to optimally develop patterns or optimal discovery of ProSite patterns. Anybody looked at that yet? Well, that really tells the whole story, okay? So uh, after I spent a few hours here of explaining how this works, you should look at that one page because it summarizes it all. Uh, but I'll, let you, I'll let, you, let you take a look at that. Mostly what people do in one way or the other is some kind of multiple alignment of the, f the sequences that are in the family. So you multiply align the sequences in the family in some way, and we have different multiple alignment programs, and therefore we have different ways of doing it. But uh, after you have a multiple alignment of the, of the family members, then uh, you do some kind of analysis, principally column-wise, to find what portions of that multiple alignment seem to be the most conserved. Where does the multiple alignment look quite variable? And where does it look highly conserved? From the highly conserved portions, then you can define things like patterns, regular expressions, motifs, whatever you want to call those things. And again, people have lots of different ways of doing it, and therefore there are lots of different programs, and there's no one that seems to be best. People continue to experiment and people continue to try to demonstrate how uh, good their techniques are on particular data sets. There's lots of uh, disagreement about these things. So let me, um, now that I've given you the big picture, the big picture is we want to go this direction. This is a much harder direction to go in than this was. People found sequence similarity implies biological similarity, tremendously valuable, relatively easy. Um, by doing alignment, when it comes to extracting a very weak signal from a family members, that's a much more difficult uh, undertaking. Has not been nearly as successful, but uh, it does uh, exist in many services, many databases, where they have done that. It found patterns. Another one is called blocks. Um, they found patterns. They found uh, motifs that can be used to recognize additional members of the family. So the whole point of having one of these patterns, one of the major points of having one of these patterns or motifs or regular expressions is so that you can recognize additional members of that family. That is, you have some sequence, uh, protein sequence, that you don't know very much about. You've studied protein sequences from yeast and uh, E. coli and Drosophila and salamanders and uh, fish and who knows what else. And now you have uh, one that comes from a zebra or a human, and you want to know is it, is it uh, functionally related to the to some family that you already understand. And when you just do pairwise alignment to the members in that family, it's not 
The similarities are not strong enough to see that relationship. Blast won't give it to you. Um, just pairwise alignment won't give it to you. Local alignment won't give it to you because it's, it's, uh, it's too subtle. But if the pattern can say, yes, that's in that family, uh, then you, you can infer some biology about that new sequence. All of these are intended to have that purpose. And these are the ones we're going to talk about. I could probably make a list, at least another 20 different uh, programs, ideas, approaches that follow this pattern that I've been talking about. But these are the ones that I am going to talk about. So the first one is possums, PSSMs, Position Specific Scoring Matrices. Okay. Position Specific Scoring Matrix. Okay. So got a family, somehow did a multiple alignment. From that multiple alignment, I want to extract out some kind of pattern, some kind of reflection of that multiple alignment that lets me recognize, hopefully, additional members of this family that have been lost, their uh, long lost cousins, but you now want to recognize that they're really part of that family. Position-specific scoring matrices were things that were invented maybe 20 years ago and are precursors to particularly HMMs and also Cyblast, which I'll get to. By the way, how many people have ever used any of these? Which one have you used? Okay. Any, anybody else? Which me. M -E -M -E, yes, another that's another kind of thing that's related to it's sort of an after multiple alignment. Yeah, you know, we're not going to talk about that in this class, but that's one of the twenty that we're not going to talk about. Anybody else? I guess there, there aren't as many. Uh, uh, the first time I taught this, we had a lot of people in class who were uh, had already been using a lot of these things, but they didn't know how they worked. I guess most most of those people have already had this class at this point. But a lot of people use Cyblast. Sort of Cyblast is the uh, Cyblast and, and PFAM, now Prosite, actually all of these, are really central tools that people use a lot. Okay, so PSSMs are kind of the precursor of all of these, and I want to start talking about that before I talk about the other ones that are more current. So let me just this little example. We have a family of sequences that we've multiply aligned. Okay. So that's my family. That's my multiple alignment. And all I'm going to do with that, just to keep it simple, I'll just pretend it's DNA, although mostly it's protein. And to keep it simple, I'll just assume there are five positions, although Again, that's a gross over, oversimplification. And the first thing I want to do is just count the frequent, how often I see an A in the first position in the multiple alignment, how often I see a T, and so on. So I just want to get a, a count of the uh, occurrences, 3, 0, 0, 3. I'm just making up an example here. I made one up. Uh, that will be used as we go forward. Zero six, zero zero, one two, two one, and zero three, zero three. So just imagine I've counted, and uh, just again to keep things simple, imagine this multiple alignment doesn't permit spaces. This is a very, very simple multiple alignment where we just, let's say it's a local multiple alignment. Somehow we've picked out some substrings that are of high similarity of interest, and uh, we've counted it. Okay, then all I'm going to do next is, is convert this to uh, fractions, to frequencies. 
Okay. So. Um, Actually, that's not quite what I'm going to be doing. ATCG, one, two, three, four. Actually, let me tell you what I do, and then we'll figure out what it must have been. Work backwards. Two thirds, oh, except I know there's an error. This is going to be an interesting exercise. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this is the fraction in position I, which is residue X divided by the general fraction. which is x, which I'm going to just take as one-fourth. Okay, so let's see if this makes sense. Uh, what fraction is a in this position? It's 3 out of 6. That's a half, okay? And what fraction is a in general, not in this data, but over a, a large number of DNA sequences? I'm just going to take as a quarter. So a half divided by a quarter is 2. That's where this 2 came from, OK? And this, this 2 is the same story. Now, I'm not sure I did the arithmetic right. I think I remember that there's a slight error here. But let's just see. This should be a third divided by a fourth. So um, a third divided by a fourth. does not look like two-thirds. That's where my, that's one error. So that's four-thirds. So these are right, OK? And the next one should be a six divided by six, which is one, OK, uh, divided by a fourth. So that's four. That's position three. Four, five. Okay. Then we have um, one sixth divided by a fourth. That's four sixths, which is two thirds, right? I don't have that on my sheet, but anyway. Uh, and then this is one third divided by a fourth, which is four-thirds, and, um, and then one-sixth, and then two-thirds. And five is zero, two, zero, two. OK? So that's where each number comes from. It's the fraction in position i, which is residue x. Here are the position i's. Here are the residues. Divided by the fraction, if this was just random strings, what fraction you would expect there, which is a quarter? Now, can anybody see intuitively why did I take this ratio? What happens is I'm really sort of normalizing by what you'd expect to see at random. And uh, instead, what you're seeing in this specific family, in this specific family, you're seeing very strongly an A or a, a G uh, in that position, very weakly a T or a C. Okay, so this is a position-specific scoring matrix. Uh, oftentimes, people take the log of these numbers. And I'll explain why they do that next time. But anyway, this is uh, where we'll stop for today. <laughs>